Hi, this is the Magnificent Midlife Podcast and I'm Rachel Lancaster. This is where we celebrate women in midlife and beyond. We challenge the status quo and bash those negative stereotypes about being an older woman. We're not over the hill at 40, 50, 60. We're just getting started. And the world needs us now more than ever. I'll be talking all things midlife, about issues that matter, and sharing fabulous stories of amazing women doing very cool stuff. Now is our time. I'm very excited today to interview Kat Corchado, and she is a US Air Force veteran turned founder of the Small Space Pilates community. She's made it her mission to help women veterans transition from the military and is the host of the Sisters in Service podcast. And we've tried a couple of times to make this happen, haven't we, Kat? And we've, <laughs> yeah, we've been yeah. scuppered by the technology. But today, here you are. <laughs> we're alive. We're, we're, we're doing, doing it. it. <laughs> this is very exciting. Finally got here. So welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to finally be here. <laughs> now, I know you left the military quite a while ago, but you are still very active in the community. Why is that so important to you? Well, when I got out in 2000, way back in the olden days, and a lot of people coming out of the military have a hard time transitioning into civilian life. And even though I had that problem, I thought it was just me. I thought I was doing it wrong because no one talks about it. So flash forward seven years. So 2007, um, you know, you just... I started to notice that other women were not coming out as veterans. What I mean by coming out is they weren't raising their hand and saying, hey, I'm a veteran. And so I started thinking, what's going on here? And I kept hearing about how women were still, not just women, but everybody who was leaving the military still having a problem with this. So in 2017, I became part of the Women Veterans Network and we're still talking about transition and how difficult it is. And I said, this, this is crazy. They haven't fixed this yet. And so what we, what we discovered is that the military doesn't want to fix it because you're no longer needed by them. You're on your way out. So they do the absolute minimum that they think they need to do. And then they go, okay, bye. See ya. And you're in this, this kind of, um, You've got one foot in the civilian world and one foot still in the in the military world. And you're straddling the two and you're like, I'm not sure, am I, a, you know, am I a civilian? Am I military? You know, how do I get there? So because of that problem, on top of some of the things that women have talked about, among other things, um, military sexual trauma and stuff like that, I thought, you know what, you know, I need to be involved and, and see how I can help, if at all possible. So you, when did you start the Sisters in Service podcast? That was during COVID. And so I'd had this idea that I wanted to do a podcast. Now, keep in mind, I had never heard a podcast before. <laughs> I didn't listen to any podcast. My husband did all of that. And I'm like, I'm going to do a podcast. <laughs> and I had no idea what to do. But coming from the military, I'm, I'm a systems girl. Give me, you know, I'm an ABC one, two, three you know, do it. Step one is this step two is this. So I decided to take a course on it and see what would happen. And I became very intrigued with it. And I said, okay, after I learned everything, I said, I'm going to do this. And I started doing it. And it's, I just have, this is perfect timing because I I'm celebrating my three year anniversary of my podcast this month. It's fantastic. And I bet there aren't many are there specifically for female veterans. Not hundreds, not even 50. There might be 10. You know, for military in general, sure. But for women, I think it's it's about five or six. I'll say seven tops. And what do you find that you're talking about on the podcast? One of the things that I really wanted to do was was highlight some of the issues that women veterans go through because it's very different than what the men go through. And I wanted this to be a platform for women to be to feel safe enough to talk about 
those things that they were afraid of when they transitioned. So one of the things I always ask them is, you know, if, if say you're a Navy veteran, I'd say, you know, Rachel, did you pick the Navy or did the Navy pick you? Because it's different. Sometimes we choose it. Sometimes it chooses us. And, you know, finding out what their transition is like, because I want other women to picture themselves in my guest story to say, oh, her transition was like mine, because they're all different, but they're all hard. And to be able to let women understand that this is a safe place for them to talk about whatever, but also a place to highlight the fact that they came through the transition. Some of them are building businesses. Some of them are going into politics. Sometimes they're doing all types of things. They're building nonprofits. They're building these empires. They're writing books. And I want people to hear and see that it's not, oh, poor women veterans. It's like, okay, don't feel bad for me because this is what I'm doing now. And to highlight their business and put it out there so people Well, know. you're shining a light on what they're doing, aren't you? Which is brilliant. Absolutely. Yes, I'm trying to. That's, what, that's one of my goals. And what sort of, I'm guessing there isn't an average age, but is there an average age when women tend to leave the military? What, what's the age range? It's not so much the age as it is in how many years serve. So some people serve four years and get out. You know, some people serve two years and say, yep, I'm done. And then they go into the reserve. So it's, it depends on how long they serve. You know, so they get out anywhere between one and 20 or one and 30, depending on what branch of the service you're in. I did 20. I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Um, but I think it's, I think the longer you're in, the harder the transition tends to be because you're so military focused that you forget who you are, you know, who was Kat when she's not in the uniform. So I always, when I talk to women who are still in the military, I, I give them this exercise. I said, pretend we're at a networking event. You're introducing yourself, but you can in no way talk about the military, that you're in the military. You can't talk about your service. You can't talk about your rank. You can't talk about anything. And they can't. It's hard for them. And I said, you need to figure out who are you when you don't have that uniform on because the time's going to come when that's going to happen. What kind of hobbies do you have? What are you interested in? What are you doing now? What do you aspire to do or to be or, you know, whatever that might be? And to talk about those, th those things and then say, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm also a veteran. I think that's really interesting. It's just something that's just occurred to me because women are generally, okay, I'm making a great big generalization here, but I don't think that women are often as defined by their career as men are because women have Absolutely. other things going on. But it sounds a little bit like if you're a veteran as a woman, and especially if you spend a long time in the military, that's as traumatic for you, for a woman as maybe a man having had a 40, 50 year career and then retiring. And then who are they now? Well, absolutely. Women veterans are more likely to become homeless than their male counterparts. Wow. And if you think about it, if you have two people in the military, husband and wife, you know, the man goes to his job, he comes home, he might help in the household, maybe not. The woman, the wife is going to change hats. She's no longer military. Now she's mom. She's, as my mother used to say, chief cook and bottle washer. You know, she does all those things. So if you think about getting out, a lot of times women getting out with children are divorced. So they have control, not control of the kids, but you know, they're, they're sole provider. So you get out of the military, you have to find a job, you have to find a place to live, you have to find schools, you have to find all this stuff. And it's overwhelming on top of everything that you're feeling as a woman getting out of the military. And it's so difficult. If you think about it, a man gets out, he goes, he does some networking, you know, it's, it's the good old boys club most of the time. And they get a job because of who they know, which, which is a great way to find a job, by the way. But, you know, they don't have to go through all the other stuff. Whereas women have to get out of the military, deal with transition and the kids and the schools and find a job and, uh, and moving if they're moving from where they are. 
And it's a lot to deal with. My goodness. Yeah. I hadn't really appreciated it as as that. I can see that it's, it's massive, isn't it? Absolutely. So what first took you into the military and where did you serve? I became a single parent at a very young age. And, you know, for your listeners, it's one thing when you're hungry, but when your child is crying because they're hungry, it's a whole different reality. And I was born into the military. My dad was military, you, um, Air Force. And so I traveled all over the con- different countries, you know, and, and I got to know a little bit about the Air Force. And so when it came down to what do I want to do, I actually decided to go in the Air Force because it's something I was familiar with. But I said, you know, I'm going to go in for four years, give my head some time to, you know, figure out what I want to do. I'm bringing in some money. You know, we have a place to live, et cetera. And I ended up staying 20 years. (laughs) But I got to go to some amazing places, you know, with with my dad. I got to go to England and, and Germany. We got to visit you know, France, we got to visit Spain. When I was in, my first tour duty was Azores, Portugal. I got to go to Korea. Um, I mean, just some countries that a lot of kids just see on TV or in pictures. And I got to experience it. I got to experience the food, the culture, all of that. And it was, it's an amazing education. And I've just been reminded of the conversation that we had when I came on your podcast to talk about menopause and you (laughs) expressed your appreciation for Cadbury's chocolate. (laughs) Yes. No, this Hershey's rubbish. Sorry, American listeners. I know. No, no Hershey's rubbish. No Hershey's rubbish. I, to this day, I'm a chocolate snob, you know, and my mother... (laughs) Um, we grew up on Cadbury's. It was the first chocolate I can remember was coming from my mom. And to this day, she still sends us a Christmas box with, you know, Cadbury's chocolate and Maltesers and flakes <laughs> and, and all of that, you know, and we're looking forward to it. Like, where's our box? When are we getting our box? <laughs> Just suddenly remembered that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow, so you travel, you travel all over, all over, didn't you? Yeah. Absolutely. I was actually born in England. Uh So it was, you know, it felt like home. And I just, I remembered, and this was just a while, just a little bit ago, that remembering the first music I ever heard was the Beatles before the Beatles came to the United States. Oh my goodness. I already heard Beatles music, but you know, as a child, you're like, no, you know, you don't think about that. But looking back on that, I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. I'm kind of special. I'm just going to say. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. And what was, what was your own transition like when you left the military? Well, a lot of people leaving have this trepidation and this fear of, of leaving the military, and rightfully so. I was ready. I always tell people, I was like, you know, if you, anybody who's a sports fan listening, I was like that first round draft pick out of college, just knowing You know, I walked out and I expected music, streamers, (laughs) you know, all this stuff and companies throwing contracts at me. Yo, pick us, pick us. And there was nothing there. There was nobody there. And I I jokingly say I thought I had the wrong day. Um, (laughs) But it I thought, okay, what is this? You know, I get out. I'm doing my thing. But I kept feeling this this something. And now I realize I was mourning the loss of my service. And you mourn it, you actually do. You know, it's like when your kids are with you, with you, with you, and then they go to college and you go, oh my, (laughs) I didn't think I was gonna miss, you know, this little person. And it was difficult, but I didn't know that's what it was, Rachel. Okay, I did not know that's what it was. And so I I just kind of kept it to myself because Nobody came back and said, oh, transition is greater. Oh, transition is horrible. It's just that it's it's like this little dirty word that no one wanted to talk about at the time. So when I got out, it it just felt like I thought I was doing it wrong. (laughs) Although I don't know how you were supposed to do it. But, you know, I found myself on my feet. It feels like you're kind of on, 
you know, if you're balancing, you know, you're like, oh, you're wobbling and you don't feel steady. That's how I felt was that I was not steady on my feet. And I finally found myself on, you know, steady ground and, but I still didn't feel right. I still didn't feel like I had the whole transition thing down. And I think it was because I just didn't come out and say, I'm a veteran. And once you acknowledge that, once you really embrace it, it changes everything about you. And so once I did that, once I said, you know what, I'm a veteran, why am I hiding this? And uh, it changed my whole perspective. How? Once you acknowledge it, you realize that you had a hard transition and you're not afraid to say it out loud. And what I want to say that is this, is that a lot of times women, even in their own families, are considered not, they're not veterans. If you didn't fight in a war, you're not a veteran. Oh, you only served in, in this branch of the service. The Air Force gets a lot of jokes. Oh, chair force, you know, and all this other stuff. I don't look like a veteran. I've been told that. Um, I've parked in veteran parking. There's a, a supermarket here that has veteran parking. And I've been challenged on several occasions. You know, why are you parking here? This is for veterans only. And I'm like, yes, I know. And even on the back of my license plate, it says U.S. Air Force retired. And yet they assume by looking at me that I'm not a veteran. But as I've gotten older, I'm very adamant. You know, I don't get nasty. I don't get verbal. You know, I've had people say, I'm going to call the cops on you. I'm like, okay, tell them I'm in the supermarket <laughs> shopping. And when they get here, I'll gladly speak to them. And they're, they're kind of taken aback by my attitude. I don't get mad anymore. I'm a veteran. I'm, I can prove that I'm a veteran. So, you know, you're the one that has the issue. But it's, it's as I've gotten older and the longer I've been out, it's become very, very, it's, it's part of who I am. Being a veteran is who, a part of who you yeah, are. Yeah, it's yeah, part yeah. of your life. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to just say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran. No, when, baseball games, when they, you know, they say all the veterans stand up, I willingly stand up. You know, so I do all of that. This is such a difference culturally between the US and the UK. And I, I actually, in, in another life that people won't know about, but I, I still write an annual report every year for a big, huge British company. And I've done it now. It's about 15 years I've done it. And they keep coming back, bless them. And um, I know every year it's like, can you rewrite our story again? Yeah, yeah, I knew that. But most of, well, not most, but a big proportion of their business is in the States. And it's a rental business. And they take great pride in employing lots of veterans. And then that has transferred to their British business as well, which is also now looking at employing lots of veterans because there are loads of transferable skills yes that they can make the most of and they find that their veterans do so well in their you know rental business that they have and for example they're one of the biggest players when there's a big disaster um whether that be a weather disaster or whatever you know um they are first on the ground. They are the first responders providing the rental equipment that people need to put things back together. And what has been fascinating for me, because here in the UK, we don't really recognize veterans. I mean, there's you talking about you parking in a spot for veterans. There's no parking for veterans here in the UK. Whereas I know that this company, their people, they have uniforms, obviously, because they work for the company, but they have a badge on their uniform if they are a veteran. I love so that. they are automatically both internally they are recognized as a veteran and they are recognized as a veteran with their customers. And I, th I think that's really powerful. And I really like that. But it's completely something new to the UK because... You know, and and I think what you've talked about this this difficulty of transition, this you know, not claiming that you are a veteran, not owning it, not being out there, because it's 
it's a contentious issue even over here. It's a political issue over here. And it really, I don't think it should be. It shouldn't be because shouldn't if be. you're a veteran, you've given service for your country. And that that's ultimately what's important. Whether or not you agree with the government of the day and where they're sending the military Absolutely. is the fact that you gave service. And so it's really, it's interesting to hear you talk about that because, you know, and you'd never, you'd never get a football game. People saying veterans stand up. It just wouldn't happen over yeah. here. But it why should. not? It yeah, should. It should. I think Absolutely. it'd be really nice. Yeah. We have Remembrance Sunday once, once mm -hmm. a year. And then, you know, that's really the only time that we mm -hmm. reckon. And then we do it because we're really, we're remembering the war, not necessarily the veteran. Exactly. Even on, we have what's called Memorial Day mm. in May and people go happy Memorial Day. And I'm like, no, mm. this is in memoriam of all of those who fought for our country and passed away. Mm. So it's not happy Memorial Day. It's happy mm. to you because it's a day off. It's a three day weekend. <laughs> but for those of us as, that served, we're the ones that, you know, we remember, you know, why we have the freedoms that we have, because these people gave the ultimate sacrifice so that you can go to the beach on your three-day weekend. So, yeah, it's the same thing. It's just different levels of it. But I hope that we can take more of what you do for the vet. And it's interesting because I, if, if I didn't do this work for this particular client... You would I would have never known. I wouldn't have known, mm -hmm. no. And I wouldn't, you know, and every year I get to write, because now I, I do the sustainability reports as well, you know, and I get to write about, you know, their veteran programs and they are so proud of this. And I think it's really powerful. Yeah. It's better now than it used to be. When I got out, it was, you know, no one knew how to transfer my skills. You know, I was a communications project manager you think, oh, project manager, and no one wanted to talk to me. Even though I had 20 years doing it, I have soft skills, I have all these other skills, and no one wanted any part. I find now that a lot of veterans are getting jobs through other veterans. So other veterans are in charge of you know, a company, and they said, we're, we're hiring veterans, and it's nice to go into a company where there's a veteran program, where there are other veterans. It's hard to be the first one because mm -hmm. nobody understands. There's no, you know, veteran community. You know, people, you know, I get asked silly questions all the time, like being in the Air Force and people say, oh, did you fly planes? I'm like, I wasn't that important. You know, <laughs> thank you for asking. <laughs> but just getting civilians to understand what it is we went through. You know, I, I had someone, this was a, quite a while ago, and we were having this conversation and he said, oh, you're getting your military, uh, your retire pay. And I go, well, yes. And he said, well, when did you get it? And I said, I, it's changed a little bit now, but I said, you know, it was like the month after I got out, I got my first um, retire pay. And he goes, well, that's why we're in debt. And that's, a, you know, I, I've done 15 years with my company and I can't retire. And I very calmly said to him, look, this was a business venture. They said, if I do this, they'll pay me this. I did the 20, they're paying me the money, done. Contract filled, that's all it is. So, you know, I think people misunderstand sometimes, you know, that our contract probably looks a lot like others uh, with the exception of that we, if needed, put our life on the line mm. and die for our country. I, I doubt if Boeing has that in their contract. <laughs> I'm just going to say. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. And as you said earlier on, it's going to be so much harder for women, especially if you're coming out of the military in midlife. Yes. Oh, my, oh goodness. my goodness. So you've got all of the ageism to contend with as well. Yes, absolutely. Ageism is real, folks. I'm just saying. <laughs> 
So what did you end up doing? Well, it's, it's funny you ask that question. So being in the military, you don't make as much money as people think. And I was a single parent. So I remember this was before paychecks went automatically into your account. And I would cash my little check and I would have $10 left over and I would just fold it up and put it in my wallet for those times when I needed bread or I needed milk or whatever. And I, I've always been fit. So I've always wanted to you know, stay fit even after getting out of the military. And so I started, you know, going to a, a fitness center and I was that, <laughs> that workout nerd. Okay. So you know, that person where the instructor's in front of you and that there's always that one person that's to the right or the left of the instructor doing exactly like the instructor. That was me. Okay. That was me. Yes. I was that nerd. And <laughs> What I didn't realize is that she was active duty military and she turned to me one day and she said, I'm getting ready to leave. Would you like to take over the class? Wow. And so this was back in the day. This was 1984, you guys, 1984. And I think they paid $5 a class. $5 a class. And I was happy. I was like, yeah, how many classes can I do? When do I get paid? And it was a little bit of extra money. And so when I started transitioning, I tried to do the traditional thing. And I just realized I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to sit down at a desk and have people tell me what to do and, and all this other stuff. I did that for 20 years. So I talked to my husband and I said, let me see if this fitness thing will work. I said, can you give me six months to a year to see if I can do it? And I was good at it. And I made some great money at it. And so that's how I left the corporate world behind and started doing fitness full time. So I have 39 and a half years in the fitness industry. Wow. I know. I'm actually 89, y'all. Just saying. No. <laughs> I look good, right? <laughs> you look great. <laughs> wow. Wow. So you're still doing that now? I am. I'm still doing, um, I've added on. I'm, I'm no longer teaching classes, but I do personal training and Pilates. And I do that with clientele, but I, I just launched last year, which is the one year anniversary this month of small space Pilates, which incorporates um, weight training, Pilates and stretching in a workout that you can do in the comfort of your own home. And it's, it's been a ride. It's been awesome. And you work a lot with women in our age bracket, don't you? Yes. I want women to understand that, you know, as we get older, a lot of women pull away from using weights. They're like, oh, I don't, I don't think I should wear, you know, do weights. But what you may not know is that if you don't do anything after the age of 30, you can lose anywhere between three and 8% of your muscle mass every decade. So if you're 50 or 55 or six, guess what? You've lost a lot of muscle. It doesn't mean you can't get it back. It just means that why lose it? Just keep it because it helps with your metabolism. It helps with all kinds of things. You know, if you get sick, it helps to, you know, build up your immunity. I feel, you know, it, it helps to keep that. So I'm sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox. No, 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 you stay on your soapbox. You stay on your soapbox because it's so, it is so important. And, and I think women don't realize it. And I think in previous lives, we used to like, keep our muscles more because we were having to do so much physical yes. work, weren't we? Whereas yes. now we have all the machines that do everything for us and we're so sedentary that we're not actually doing that. So we have to replace that with actually lifting the weights. Well, I think we have the, the ageism thing against ourselves. You know, how many times have you heard a woman say, oh, well, I can't have long hair because I'm, I'm this age now. You know, oh, I, I don't need to do weights anymore because I'm a grandma or, you know, those types of things that we tell ourselves and I'm fighting it every step of the way. You know, when, I, when it's time for me to go, I'm gonna be like, can you just hold on one minute while I finish this set? <laughs> and I want to go kicking and screaming. You know, I want to 
if it's time to go, it's time to go. But I, I think of my seventies and my eighties, and I see some of these people who are much younger than I am that already have back issues and a shoulder issue and a knee issue. And I think, what are they going to be like at my age? Mm. And so I want to be 70 and 80 years old and being able to get around on my own steam. Mm. I don't need help across the street. I'll take it, but I don't need it. Mm. But, you know, being able to just feel good and, and be that person that I've always wanted to be at 70 and 80, where I'm feisty as hell, Mm. you know, don't, don't, you know, (laughs) don't come at me with, Oh, hi, Nana. Be like, no, no. (laughs) Don't call me Nana. <laughs> I've actually, uh, well, for years, I would, if my bag was really heavy, I would let my husband carry it because he's pretty strong. And I've stopped doing that now. I've actually, and, and somebody offered to carry my bag the other day and I said, well, no, actually, this is my weightlifting. It's your, yes. <laughs> this is, this is, you know, yes. me getting my weight in mm-hmm. as I'm traveling to the airport. So thank you, but no. <laughs> Well, I think it's important for people to understand that we're all busy, okay? And so people say, oh, I don't have 20 minutes, I don't have 30 minutes. But what if I told you that you could start working out in 11 minutes a day? It's a good place to start. Don't tell me you don't have 11 minutes because I know better. You do have 11 minutes. It starts there. And to, to reframe how we think of working out, we think of weight training, we think of cardio, we think of sweating, we think of, uh, you know, what about a dance break for five minutes? you know, with your favorite playlist? What about walking around wherever you, you know, live, you know, walking around the block for five minutes, you know, reframe what you think of as exercise. You know, when I clean the house, I put my Apple watch on and I'm cleaning the house. And yes, I do burn calories doing that. So we have to reframe what we think of as exercise because a lot of things, walking the dog, yes, that counts as exercise. So, you know, I think we just need to reframe how we think about it. I think often it's easier to talk in terms of movement, isn't it? I think people yes. often really, they don't like the word exercise, but if you talk or in fitness. terms of movement or fitness. Yeah. yeah, if I start to say movement, then people kind of lean in and go, oh, what do you mean? Oh, yeah. And then I start off with the dancing and the, you know, all of this other stuff. I just recently, as recently as June, started roller skating again at the age of really? 66. I wow. did. Wow. Okay, I remember no, seriously impressed. I remembered way back in the day, there was about two years when I was between nine and 11 or eight and 10, something like that. I lived in roller skates. That was my mode of transportation, that and a bike, but roller skating was more fun. And I thought, I want to do that. And so I did. I bought my roller skates for my birthday. I've been roller skating. And honestly, when I have my roller skates on, I think of nothing else. But And afterwards, when I take them off, I think, oh my God, that was so much fun. That's all I think about. But it's is, a brilliant much... form of exercise. I know yes. that. Yes. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to do it, to be honest, because I didn't learn mm-hmm. before and now I'm too scared. So <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. And I think that's what it is. It, it might it's, be it's fear. Fear that stops me. Yeah. yeah. But a lot of people say, well, aren't you afraid? And I'm like, afraid of what? Oh, aren't you? What about you fall down? I go, I have protective gear. What if you break a hip? I'm not going to break a hip. I'm a fitness instructor. (laughs) I'm a personal trainer. I'm a Pilates instructor. So I'm not going to break anything, Mm. you know? And if I thought that I was going to break something, I wouldn't have bought the skates. But, you know, Mm. I'm like, you know what? I just think of it as having fun. I don't think about it as falling down. Yeah. Because if if you think about falling down, guess what? You're going to fall down. (laughs) (laughs) Good for you. Good for you. So why I have, I've never been a fan of Pilates. I love Mm -hmm. yoga. So why, why should women do Pilates? Good question. I think Pilates really pays attention to how your body is in space. It gives you body awareness. So what I mean by that is, you know, so many times I will point out to clients that they're sinking into one hip or they're sitting like this or, and they have no clue that they're doing that. So anytime your body's out of alignment, other muscles that shouldn't be working are working. Pilates addresses 
um, getting longer when you feel like you, you've ever heard somebody say, oh, I'm shrinking. Mm. Pilates lengthens you to where you're sitting here. Is it great for your core? Yeah. But I want to get away from the core thing because that's all people think Pilates is, is core. Although it's great for core, it's also great for strength in ways that you never thought about. Mm. And it's a great way to just understand where your body is in space and how your body is is applied to, to Pilates. Meaning we do an exercise and you're like, you know, I might say, okay, you know, lay on your stomach, blah, blah, blah. And they go, okay. And then they do it and they go, why is this so hard? And so it's understanding that we're overusing some muscles and underusing other muscles. Women have a tendency to overuse their quad muscle, the front of their thigh, underuse their bottom. They haven't spoken or talked about their bottom in years unless it's in a bathing suit and their inner thighs don't work. And it's not until we do Pilates that they go, why can't I do this? And so I love yoga. Don't get me wrong. I think they were mutually... Um, that you can use both of them. Your Pilates can make your yoga better. Your yoga ma can make your Pilates better. But if someone came to me and says, I, I'm not sure I should do yoga or Pilates, I'm going to say, how strong is your core? And they're like, I have no core. Start with Pilates. Then you can go to yoga and then do both if you want to. But I, I think it's important for not only men, um, not only women, but men also, if you play golf, any sports, you need Pilates. I have, you know, a couple of NFL players that I, I take through um, a Pilates workout. Dancers, if you're, you know, ballet, they, they're doing Pilates, you know, so it doesn't matter whether you've done Pilates or not. I've had some people think that, you know, oh, I did Pilates and it was easy. And I, and I say to them, you weren't doing Pilates. Because <laughs> <laughs> when they try to, you know, they'll say, oh, I'll do a, a you know, a session with you. And they're, and they're, they're like, oh my gosh, this is nothing like what I had done before. And the problem is that it's getting, remember when yoga was yoga and then it starts branching off into all of these other things. And you're like, wait, what happened to the core part of Pilates? So people are calling things Pilates that are not Pilates. So, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and, and you know, say, hey, is this Pilates? I'll be like, no, or yes, absolutely. That is Pilates. So it's, it's a little difficult. It gets me a little angry when I see stuff like that. But I, I know that these people are trying to sell something and I just want people to feel good in their bodies. That's all I want them to do because they have the right to that. You have the right to feel good in your body. Now, whether you choose to apply that or not is up to you. But I, I think if you plan on being around for a while and seeing your grandchildren and maybe even your great grandchildren, then you need to do something. I think I might revisit Pilates. Mm. I'll do it. I'll do it slightly grudgingly. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think probably I ought to revisit it. Yeah. Yeah. You never know. I mean, it's I always tell people when you're trying to find an instructor, whether it's yoga, Pilates, personal training, have three people that you want to interview and interview them. Ask them questions. How long have you been doing this? You know, what are the things that you focus on? You know, how close are, are you to the studio? All of these things. And then pick your top person and make sure that they can accommodate you. You know, so a lot of people say, oh, you're a Pilates instructor. Okay, I want to do Pilates and they know nothing about me. I am good, y'all. I'm just going to say. <laughs> but, <laughs> cool. but um, you know, find out a little bit about them because, you know, it's, it's like personal training. Just because someone looks good in their body doesn't mean they're good at training your body. So I'll leave it there. That's a good line. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Now, before we hit record, we were having a little conversation about busyness. Yes. And I said, let's talk about that when we're actually recording, because I think that's interesting. And I think a lot of women, our age group, get stuck in busyness. And I've been talking about this with a lot of friends, colleagues recently. And I think there is a real danger of burnout. Yes. Um, there's a real danger of, you know, we're burning the candle at both ends. We're trying to be everything to everybody. 
and we can get stuck in the busyness. So what does it mean for you to be stuck in the busyness? I think a lot of times as we get older, we say yes to things that we really don't want to say yes to. And as I've gotten older, you know, and someone says, hey, you want to go to lunch? And you really want to, but it's on a day when you're back to back with stuff. And so you say yes, and now you're even busier. And so as I've gotten older, I just realized that I want to do something, but maybe the day and time that someone wants me to do it doesn't work for me. No doesn't mean no forever. It just means no right now. Mm. And really choosing to slow down a little bit. A lot of people don't like that word slow down. But sometimes when you slow down, you go, why was I doing all that hot mess, making myself crazy, not sleeping well, not eating well. And once you get rid of that, you just, you just have this time. And so what I've found is that when I am at a point where everything is just working, meaning I'm not over busy, I'm not under busy. I always take a day off. It's called Catitude Day, which is Sunday. And I do absolutely nothing, or I do whatever I want to do on that day with no judgment. And I find that I'm more creative. I can get more done the following week. So I look at my schedule, and even though a client might reach out to me and say, hey, can you do this day at this time? And even though I can, doesn't mean I should. Mm -hmm. And if it's back to back to back, I'm going to say no, because it's not serving me. If it serves both of us, fine. But if it's not serving me or it's going to put me in the state of anxiety, then I'm going to say no. It's really important, isn't it? Getting that balance because you're a passionate woman. I'm a passionate woman. We've got things we want to do. We've got lives we want to change. Yes. But we've, as you say, it's got to serve us as well as serving other people. And yeah, we can get very stuck in the business. I have to take a breath. I have to think, okay, yeah. Can I sustain this? Do I need to slightly step back a little bit and manage my energy better? Absolutely. I had, um, you know, Sundays are are my days off, but I went two weeks where I was you know, I was just doing stuff on the computer and then I ended up being there like four or five hours doing something. And I did that two weeks in a row. And can I tell you that by that third week, I couldn't even put, I couldn't have even done this podcast because I couldn't put two words together. I was tired. I was irritable. I was not a happy person. And it wasn't until I realized what I did that I was like, why did I do that? So no more. My, my favorite color is purple. On Sundays, it says Catitude Day, and the entire day is blocked off because it's my day. So we have to start doing that for ourselves. Yeah, we really do. It's mm -hmm. very, very important. Absolutely. Well, this, is, this has been a, a brilliant conversation. I've loved it. I'm so glad that we've been able to finally connect. I'd like just to ask you finally, what would you most like women to know? Choose to be happy. We always talk about when I get this, I'll be happy. When I go on vacation, I'll be happy. When I buy this car, I'll be happy. This purse, these shoes, I'll be happy. Just choose to be happy. I watched this documentary and it was about the blue zones. And it's all these people that are in their late nineties, over a hundred years old, still contributing, still doing all these things. And this one woman, I think it was Thailand, I think. And he, the guy asked her, he said, what's, what's the key? And she said, move daily and do what you love and choose to be happy. And I said, there it is. So choose, make the conscious choice to be happy. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, follow and share it. Also, giving a five-star review really helps get the word out. 
You'll find the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you can get my book, Magnificent Midlife, Transform Your Middle Years, Menopause and Beyond. Make the very best of your next chapter. Help me change the world, one magnificent midlife woman at a time. 